And now, with the ethics and validity of medical testing on animals reaching a crucial point, we're going to speak to Animal Defenders International about that very subject and about uh, one of the many aspects that we have to consider. And this is in the light of a BBC documentary drama that was released last week. I'm delighted to welcome Vice President of Animal Defenders International, Tim Phillips, to the programme. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Now, um, as I said, this is, you know, there are many reasons why we need to be really taking this subject seriously. But let me ask you to introduce this by telling us about this documentary and actually what it focused on. Well, this focused on a, a drug trial 10 years ago in which uh, human volunteers went into a, a commercial contract testing laboratory, were paid to take a drug which had been extensively tested on animals and it went disastrously wrong in in just within hours um, and left them fighting for their lives. One one subject lost fingers and toes and uh, there may still be further implications for the people that they, they could be have a threat of cancer hanging over them. And it, it really highlighted the invalidity of animal experimentation. And yet, that's one of the few things that's been addressed since this disastrous drug trial. Because this drug had been extensively tested on animals. It had been given to mice, rats, dogs and monkeys. It had been through all of the standard tests. Mm. It had been given to monkeys in doses 500 times higher than it was given to the human volunteers. And so it highlights just how misleading animal testing is and why we need a root and branch reform. There were alternatives which could have been used before this human trial. And instead, they moved to testing in doses in humans that almost killed them. And significantly since this, it's now being tested in Russia this t some 10 years later in much, much smaller controlled doses. So it's another example how this could still potentially be a useful drug. Drugs can be very dangerous when they're fighting invasive diseases. But again, because of the misleading animal test that set up this disastrous drug trial, something that should be explored in proper human trials, in proper non-animal methods, could have been delayed 10 years. And that's not the first time that's happened either because of misleading animal tests. This is a, an issue that is highlighted by um, those campaigning for a scientific review debate, a robust debate about the use of animals in medical experiments. This idea that um, the, the human-animal model cannot cross over, that there is not enough evidence to do so. What was the BBC's motivation for, for publishing this docudrama? Well, I think the BBC's... Um motivation was that it, it was a fascinating trial and it, and it led to reforms of how drug trials are, are conducted um, all the way across Europe and, and the safeguards for the volunteers and so on. And it did touch on the fact that this had been tested in animal tests and, and that, that is the crucial start point of this. The animal tests led to this disaster and yet in the kind of reform that followed that wasn't addressed. There was no root and branch reform. If animal tests are so misleading on this one particular drug, what do we change to make that different? And, and we're uncovering evidence of it's just a shamble, an, an, shambles animal testing where people are just ticking off the tests. Yes, we're going to test on mice, rats, monkeys, and dogs, and then we'll see how it does in humans. We even have exposed from contract testing laboratories how human drug test trials are continuing, are starting before even dog tests have been concluded. So these things aren't informing one and the other. It's just routinely checking off these tests. And instead of reforming it, which is a complex administrative task, instead of reforming this and getting healthcare which is really going to benefit people and get the drugs faster onto the market that we need and stop the disastrous drugs coming onto the market, it's just been left as it is and we're just continuing 
150 years on from really mm. the inception of animal experimentation using this outdated method. Tim, as well as Vice President of ADI, you're also Campaigns Director for the National Anti-Vivisection Society. And this is a, you know, this is really a point for, for me and for many people I know, a point at which we have to demand that there be a complete repraisal of what we're doing with animals in laboratories. Now, some people may need to hear about the the human cost for them to sit up and listen to the subject as a whole because it's all too easy for um, those who don't know much about it to say, well, you know, we, we, we have breakthroughs in science which help human beings and so it's justified. But, you know, that, that that's why it's important to stress that there isn't enough evidence to show that the animal model can be translated into a human model. However, we also are, in 2017 surely evolved enough to question why and how and whether we have the right to inflict the sort of pain and suffering and incarceration that we do on animals? Yes, I mean, there's, two, there's several sides to this. One, there is horrific suffering for these animals in these laboratories. When you saw those horrific side effects on the human beings and mm the fear that they endured as they did not know what was happening to them and their, their hands and their faces and other limbs were swelling up and they were in extreme pain. That's what's being done to these animals all the time in these laboratories. And also the fear factor, these animals are being strapped into... So the, the monkeys, for example, that would have been dosed with these, these, these drugs 500 times higher than human volunteers they would have been probably strapped into restraint chairs. And now that seems mild, but that's so stressful, forcing this little animal to sit down there, that these animals get so stressed that they rectally prolapse. I mean, can you imagine being that stressed and frightened that that happens in a significant number of cases? They then have a tube forced down their throat. They're conscious through this. And the drug will often be pumped directly into their stomach. Now, that's an absolutely standing. It's not even considered a severe process. So the living conditions, these animals, the experiments they undergo are absolutely brutal and they're cruel and the suffering is obvious to anybody. So there has to be an absolutely massive justification for this. And there simply isn't. There has not ever been the scrutiny and the technique, uh, the assessment of these tests to see if we really need them. We've stumbled into a regulatory regime across the, the world which dates back decade upon decade upon decade when people were fumbling to see what the best way to test these products was. And... If you want to know the human consequences and how misleading animal tests are, there's a, there's a cancer drug called tamoxifen. There's people listening today who've had breast cancer who will almost certainly be taking tamoxifen. It's been one of the most successful drugs in cancer treatment. Tamoxifen was developed as an oral contraceptive. It was patented as an oral contraceptive. It is in rodents. But in humans, it actually stimulates ovulation. It has the opposite effect. In rats, it causes cancer. In humans, it's proved to be a successful anti-cancer drug. So those, that's mm. the kind of misleading data swirling around that causes confusion, delays, and immense animal suffering. Mm. I, we, we then have to ask why. You know, we're, we're clear, and perhaps people listening aren't aware of the fact that um, beagles are still bred in the United Kingdom for use in medical experimentation. Primates are still used in laboratories across the world. I mean, it's, it's quite horrific when you look at the details of, of how many animals are suffering on a daily basis to, to succumb to the kind of tests, exactly what you're talking about there. 
I've interviewed a, a gentleman called Professor Roger Lemon. He's one of the world's leading pro-vivisection scientists. He can also be shown to have had an immense amount of funding for his experiments. Um, and, and once the dots are joined, it's clear that animal experimentation and the breeding of animals for medical experimentation is a very profitable industry. Well, that's undoubtedly true. And very few industries seek to reform themselves. The motor industry didn't fall over itself to get lead out of petrol despite the scientific evidence. Look at the cigarette industry. Industries don't tend to force themselves into the highest possible standards, even though eventually they usually comply. And there's really two sides of the animal experimentation industry. There's the academic interest and that there is someone who will like to know the memory span of a goldfish and so they will put electrodes in that fish's head and try and find it out because it's one of these things people say. That is never, ever going to be pretended that it's going to help people. And there's often just this, you know, there's research journals about how primate neurology is studied and how all of this. And it's just a study in itself to see how these other animals work. So there's, there's a purely academic interest side, and we would say that should be stopped very, very fast. And then you have the pharmaceutical testing side where they have become locked into all these scientific protocols and to get your drug in the market in Europe, in the USA, in China, and these countries, they're demanding animal tests and nobody wants to rock the boat. Everybody knows that there are better safety testing methods, but what if it has an impact on what they're doing? What if it slows them down? And so there's been consistently an inertia and a resistance to change. Then there's other smaller factors that just technology-wise lock them into animal testing. I was once with a, a group of researchers. We were funding up at uh, Birmingham Women's Hospital and they were doing fertility research. And they were doing really cutting-edge research and uh, studying human infertility. And uh, I said, why on earth are so many hundreds and hundreds of mice being used in the rest of the country when you're doing this work? And they said, well, we've got this. We're working in a women's hospital. We've got a full ethics committee. We can get the tissues. We can get consents. They've got an animal lab. And the animal lab is churning out mice every single day. Hmm. And so they're locked into that. So there's various factors. And that's why it's for government to take this by the scruff and start delivering the promises that animal experimentation only takes place when it's absolutely necessary. Because at, that, at the moment, that's one of the biggest lies ever told. Mm. And absolutely necessary. Obviously, that, that's a point for debate as well. But for government level to to get involved, then obviously the higher the profile, the voice of uh, the voice that the, the um, voices being put towards this cause, the better. Now there has been an early day motion signed by a number of MPs in Britain, certainly to push for this scientific debate. Moreover, we've had David Attenborough, no less, and Jane Goodall. I mean, one of the world's leading um, uh, naturist. I'm hoping I'm not saying the wrong way. Is it nat naturist or naturist? Is, he doesn't take naturalist. his clue. Naturalist. Oh, God. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Sir Attenborough. And, of course, uh, leading primatologist Jane Goodall, both calling now for this debate. These are people who know animals better than you and I. These are people who understand primates better than you and I, who've interacted on a very profound level with primates. Our closest relatives and... 
t time and time again, when I think of this subject, Tim, it, you know, it breaks my heart and comes into my head the phrase that I once saw somebody had written. One day, it's very possible, the way we're evolving now, it's very possible that animals will be able to communicate with us. And the question they'll ask us is why? Yeah, and... and we, we've actually passed that point. We, we have seen that chimpanzees in laboratories have learned human sign language. We've never learned their language, by the way. We've learned some of the sort of emotions of their communications and responses. This means fear and so on. But chimpanzees have actually learned human sign language. More than that, they actually taught themselves contractions of it. So I cannot turn to I can't. And that's an incredible grasp of the language. They've even taught the language to their children. And you've had chimpanzees in laboratories saying things to researchers like, we want out. Now, that was happening in the 70s. That was happening decades ago. We know that all of the primates are incredibly intelligent. We know that they suffer in a very comparable way to us in laboratories. If, if you and I, or I was shut in a small laboratory cage or put in a box and sent from Vietnam to a British laboratory, which is the root of most of these monkeys we have here, we would suffer and we would frighten and we would stress and we would probably injure ourselves trying to get out in the same way that those monkeys do. And yet we allow this to continue. And in 2007, the NAVS and ADI secured a resolution from the European Parliament saying to urgently for the Commission to set a timetable to end the use of primates in experiments. This is a first step that could be done so easily. It's mm -hmm. the end of the animal chest testing chain. It wouldn't even disrupt, disrupt the whole testing process. It would mean stop those tests earlier, get it into the human clinical methods. And I don't mean just pumping it into volunteers. I mean things like microdosing and mm. the cellular techniques, which are now so predictive of human responses. And don't do those animal tests. And, and we could be finishing these tests earlier. And if that works, which it most certainly would, finish the rodent tests earlier, and soon you're going to find you don't need any of those tests. But instead, that was sidestepped, and it was undercut by the European Parliament in the Directive on Animal Experiments, and it was further weakened by the Council of Ministers. So we just have to keep battling on this. This, this is for the good of people, and it's for the good of animals. We can end these tests. Tim, we're out of time. I want to um, refer people to Animal Defenders International, ADI, and also to NAVS, which is the um, uh, National Anti-Vivisection Society. Both of those have their own websites where listeners can find more information. And also there are many petitions online to add your voice to this. And really I urge people to get behind it. Just so that the debate can take place, Tim. Tim Phillips from uh, ADI. The last word from you, please, before I have to let you go. I just say the tragedy of it, this is, it happened again last year. A scientific study in France where volunteers were given doses 75 times lower than laboratory monkeys, and one of those volunteers died. Mm. So it goes on. Tim Phillips, thank you so much for joining us today.